Today, we're thrilled to have with us uh, Professor Helen Zoe Veith. Professor Veith is Associate Professor of History. He specializes in the history of American food in the 19th and 20th centuries. She's uh, working on a book right now that sounds extraordinarily exciting. <laughs> uh, uh, picky, a History of Children's Food, which traces the relatively recent emergence of picky eating among children in the United States. She uh, also produced a book entitled Modern Food, Moral Food, Self-Control, Science, and the Rise of Modern American Eating in the Early 20th Century, which explores food and nutrition in the progressive era. And she's also edited three books with the American Food and History book series. Uh, her writing uh, on food history has appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Washington Post, and elsewhere. And she's also attached to, uh, and directs, in fact, the what, the Ameri what America Ate Project, which is funded by the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, the digital archive, and interactive website on food in the Great Depression. Today, she's with us to deliver a presentation entitled Crisco and Confidence, Marketing Ignorance About Processed Food. Professor Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to Michael O'Rourke and to other members of the University Interdisciplinary Colloquium. Um, I really appreciate having the chance to give my talk. And thanks to all of you for coming out in the middle of the day on Friday. Uh, this is a standalone research interest for me, not connected to any of the books that I've done or I'm doing, um, I, had, I got weirdly fascinated by Crisco, um, and I hope you'll see why as I proceed. Um, before something can be good to eat, as the anthropologist Cloud Letty Strauss famously said, it has to be good to think. The story that I'm telling today is about one unlikely ingredient that has straddled the border between good to think and not good to think for more than a century. The ingredient is cottonseed, and especially cottonseed oil, a fabulously successful commercial product that served as an ingredient in all kinds of processed foods and is the basis of a range of supermarket fats during the 20th century, including Crisco, Wesson oil, cotyledone, many margarines, and vegetable oils. Yet, for the most part, cottonseed oil was successful in secret meaning that huge numbers of Americans bought it and ate it, and we still do, but relatively few people have known that they were doing so. Why? Cotton has perhaps the strongest identity of any American commodity crop. It was instantly recognizable throughout the 20th century with its cloud of white fiber and its deep associations with the Industrial Revolution, the Civil War, slavery, the New South, Virtually all Americans knew cotton, and they knew it wasn't food. Cotton was a shirt, or a bedsheet, or a tablecloth. As a food, cotton seed wasn't good to think. But the secrecy around cotton seed oil's big role in the American food system was not inevitable. Lots of other foods that most Americans had, had never eaten before and were skeptical about in the beginning became openly popular in the 20th century from peanut butter to pizza to sushi. The history of American food can look like one big parade of products moving from strange to normal. What's fascinating about cottonseed's history is that for a few decades, it was following this same pattern. During the early progressive era, and I'm gonna talk about the progressive era a bit today, that's roughly the period from 1890 through 1920. So during the early progressive era, Marketers loudly advertised the cottonseed content of their products, and consumers in large numbers knowingly bought them. But in the decades following the passage of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, an act that ostensibly led to more transparency, marketers talked less about cottonseed oil. Eventually, they stopped talking about it at all. In the wake of pure food legislation, and in conjunction with an exploding food advertising industry, that highlighted factory processing as a unique virtue, American consumers spent increasing amounts of money on food produced in factories. Cottonseed oil's history is ultimately a story of consumers' growing trust in industrially processed food and their growing comfort with ignorance about the ingredients that went into it. Before cottonseed was a commercial success, it was a waste product. The cotton gin, patented in 1793, 
had made southern planters rich by stripping the sticky seeds from cotton fiber at lightning speeds. While the fiber was sold for a profit, mounds of seeds were left behind. Some people put leftover cotton seeds in livestock feed or they strewed them over fields as fertilizer, but much cotton seed was simply left to rot. From the beginning, there was interest in cotton seeds potential as a cheap source of oil. Southerners were already experimenting with oil from sesame seeds um, and olives and poppy seeds, but these efforts were not meeting with much success. Those hills of leftover cotton seeds made them irresistible as a potential fat source. But producing palatable cottonseed oil wasn't easy. Cottonseed oil was muddy and smelly with an unpleasant taste. With any other seed, the project would have been abandoned. But unlike poppy seeds or sesame seeds or anything else, cotton seeds didn't need to be grown or even harvested. They were a pre-existing byproduct, and they were already all over the 19th century South. And so cottonseed oil pressing continued, despite its mediocre results. By 1880, there were oil mills in towns around the South, and a number of compound fats were on the market. Compound meaning a mixture. Um, they were a mixture of an animal fat, like lard or beef fat, with a little bit of cottonseed oil. And that was good because you could stretch the expensive animal fat and mask the smelliness and the bad taste of cottonseed. The most successful of these compound fats was cotyline, a mix of cottonseed oil and beef fat produced by the Chicago-based Fairbank Company, and it was heavily advertised around the turn of the 20th century. But cottonseed oil only really took off commercially once advances in laboratory chemistry and industrial processing made it palatable on its own. In the mid-1880s, a young chemist working for the Fairbank Company named David Wesson figured out that forcing steam through the oil would carry away volatile odor and color and flavor compounds, lightening it, neutralizing the taste, deodorizing it. By the end of the 19th century, Wesson was producing oil that was virtually odorless and virtually tasteless. And in 1899, he formed the Wesson Oil Company. And soon after, he launched Snowdrift, sold both as a pure liquid cottonseed oil and as a compound shortening, one of those mixtures of animal fat and vegetable oil. The term shortening had not originally referred to any specific product. For generations, it had simply meant any fat added to a dough to make it flakier. For example, I found an 1830 source that talked about Kentucky housewives shortening their bread with raccoon fat. Um, shortening, instead, is a literal description of what fat does to dough. It shortens the bonds, making baked goods crumble, a defining trait of shortbread or shortcake. As a culinary technique, shortening was ancient. People have been adding fats to doughs for millennia. And English speakers have used short as an adjective since at least the 15th century. But as a noun, shortening is actually pretty new, and it's uniquely American. Its first recorded appearance ever is in the first American cookbook, Amelia Simmons' 1796 American Cookery. And she was referring to a mixture of butter and lard when she said shortening. And you see references to shortening throughout the 19th century, usually without specifying what they were actually meaning by that. By the early 20th century, however, Americans were using shortening more specifically to refer to solid, industrially produced fats made mainly from vegetable sources and in clear distinction from lard. In fact, once solid shortening <clears throat> made mostly from cottonseed oil hit the market at the end of the 19th century, lard emerged as its main rival. To heighten the comparison, shortening manufacturers sold shortening in pails or in tubs because that's the way that lard was sold. And in contrast, um, manufacturers of oleo margarine or margarine always sold their product at this time in blocks wrapped in paper because that's how butter was sold. So they sort of identified their competition. Um, and I'm not going to talk more about lard here, but if anyone's curious, I think there are some really interesting ways um, that marketing for neutral cottonseed oil changed consumers' perceptions of taste itself, so potential Q&A material. When cottonseed marketers condemned lard, 
they generally did so by holding up cottonseed oil as a superior modern alternative, not as a dark secret. Most cottonseed oil marketers in the progressive era openly advertised the fact that their products came from the same cotton fields as the shirts on everyone's backs, and they celebrated this versatility as the result of ingenuity. If anything, cottonseed's long history as a byproduct that people hadn't been able to figure out how to use became a special virtue according to progressive values. It was a leftover and a nuisance transformed into something useful, profitable, and problem-solving in its own right, a cheap and novel source of fat, and a remarkable shape-shifter that could serve as the basis of all kinds of other processed foods. Cottonseed oil could, quote, make oil without olives, butter without cows, ice cream without cream, lard without hogs, according to an industry spokesman. Highly processed cottonseed oil was the result of a kind of industrial alchemy that progressive era Americans liked and admired. Another reason that cottonseeds seemed so uniquely promising in the progressive era was that they could do more than make fat. They could also make a high protein flour. After cottonseeds had been pressed for their oil, there was still a mass of crushed seeds left behind. Finding a way to, to use this leftover cottonseed meal, which was in essence the byproduct of a byproduct, was a quintessential progressive food project. Yet even at the height of progressive era enthusiasm, not everyone found cottonseed good to think. And indeed, a new product emerged in the national market in the early 1910s that capitalized both on cottonseed products' unique virtues and on lingering popular ambivalence about them. And its marketer's approach helped to transform American thinking on cottonseed oil and on industrial food at large. The product was Crisco, launched in 1911 by Procter & Gamble, a company that had worked with fats in other forms for decades. Founded in the 1830s, Procter & Gamble had originally focused on candle manufacturing, but it shifted to soap after the Civil War because Americans were using more kerosene and they were also bathing more. But executives observed closely as other companies started selling cottonseed oil in the form of cooking fat. In 1901, Procter & Gamble executives created their own cotton oil company, and they leased their first cottonseed oil mill. By 1905, they controlled eight mills, which gave them a steady supply of oil and independence from other suppliers. That same year, Procter & Gamble started invents investing in intensive research and development to produce their own shortening. By, by 1907, they learned about emerging hydrogenation techniques, and they aimed specifically to develop the world's first solid shortening made entirely of cottonseed oil. So no beef, no lard, just cottonseed oil. Years of research resulted in a salable product. But before Crisco's official debut, Procter & Gamble did product testing around the country and tinkered with the formula in response to consumer reaction. And this sounds normal to us today. It is normal today for companies to sink time and money into research and development and into market testing. But at the time, this was extremely novel. When Crisco finally launched in 1911, it was a juggernaut, a solid fat made entirely from a once liquid plant oil. It was a wholly new product made possible by the novel technology of hydrogenation. Pure liquid cottonseed oil had been on the market for a while. Wesson's Snowdrift had, had been such a product. But to many American consumers, liquid fats were inferior. They were used to cooking with lard and they were used to cooking with butter. So Crisco's debut meant that for the first time, cooks could substitute could substitute a cheap, shelf-stable vegetable shortening for butter or lard in virtually any recipe. Within five years of its introduction, when the American population was just over 100 million people, people, Crisco was selling 60 million cans annually and was well on its way to, quote, becoming a household wor word. Sales only increased in the years that followed, and Crisco would go on to dominate the U.S. shortening market throughout the 20th century. This kind of success for Crisco, which I imagine most or all of us had heard of before walking into the room, can seem inevitable in highlight, but it wasn't. 
Thousands of new U.S. food processing businesses emerged in the progressive era, and the great majority did not survive long. Those that did were successful marketers as much as anything else. But even aggressive advertising could not guarantee longevity. The heavily advertised coddling, for example, was already sputtering when Crisco debuted, and it shuttered soon after. But Crisco's approach was different. It was both, its marketing was both extraordinary int extraordinarily intensive and, for the time, inventive. Procter & Gamble was not only a pioneer in research and development, but also in brand prom promotion. They paid a top advertising firm to craft a national marketing campaign, and they spent lavishly on advertisements in national magazines and newspapers. And they also experimented. In some cities, they used only newspaper ads. In others, they did only outdoor advertising. In still others, they sent promoters door to door. Uh, they also sent free cans of Crisco to university scientists um, and to home economists, and then they would get their reactions and quote them in their advertisements. Crisco also aggressively sought to dominate specific market segments. One of its most enduring strategies was its appeal to Jewish cooks, who had a special interest in cooking fats. Not all American Jews kept kosher in this era, and some followed no particular food rules whatsoever. But many did follow Jewish dietary laws, and those laws included not only prohibitions against eating shellfish and pork, but also prohibitions against mixing meat and dairy in a single meal. This prohibition made the choice of a cooking fat a weighty one for Jewish cooks. Lard, a pork product, was obviously out. Suet, made from beef or mutton fat, counted as meat and couldn't be used in a meal with dairy. Schmaltz, which is rendered chicken or goose fat, was likewise considered a meat under most interpretations of Jewish dietary laws, and it was also hard to get in large quantities. Butter, meanwhile, was a dairy product, and so it couldn't be used in a meal with meat. Hence the heavy reliance in many Jewish kitchens on olive oil, despite its strong taste and its, its low smoking temperature. Early on, Procter & Gamble understood that observant Jews represented a potential niche market. The company obtained kosher certification before Crisco's launch, and they aggressively advertised it as a unique contribution to Jewish cuisine. An early ad, for example, trumpeted, Rabbi Margolis of New York said that the Hebrew race has been waiting 4,000 years for Crisco. <laughs> Procter & Gamble also extended its promotions beyond print advertising. They produced special kosher packages for Jewish grocers that included seals from individual rabbis. And by the early 1930s, the company would produce a full-length Yiddish-English cookbook called Crisco Recipes for the Jewish Housewife. Kosher observant consumers responded. Starting early in the 1910s and continuing through the 20th century, Jewish cookbooks not only called for shortening in general, but many mentioned Crisco by name. Crisco has only one ingredient, hydrogenated cottonseed oil. Yet one of the most remarkable things about it was that its marketers obscure, obscured its cottonseed content from the beginning. A very few early materials mentioned cottonseed oil in the fine print, but the vast majority of its packaging and advertising and books and all sorts of every single um, material associated with it stayed completely silent about its one and only ingredient. Even its name hid the secret. Crisco was short for crystallized cottonseed oil, but the average consumer never learned that. Instead, Crisco marketers stressed its unparalleled purity while dodging questions about its actual ingredients. It was not mixed with lard or suet like those compound fats they exerted, but instead it was a purely vegetable product, absolutely all vegetable. And lest consumers start to ask hard questions about exactly which vegetables were yielding so much oil, marketers volunteered evasive non-answers like, Crisco is 100% shortening, and Crisco is Crisco and nothing else. Why such evasion? Its competitors had always been transparent about their cottonseed content. Cotyline is a case in point. Um, its manufacturers lent heavily on nostalgic associations between cotton and slavery, and they made full use of cotton's botanical beauty, with sprigs of cotton appearing on all packaging and promotional materials. In fact, 
In 1894, a lard company had actually sued the Fairbank Company because they said the name Cotyline is so close to the word cotton that they couldn't legally trademark it. It was an unsuccessful lawsuit, uh, but an important part of early trademark law. Cotyline's trademark image, too, which it went out of the way to bring to consumers' attention, featured a cow's head, representing the beef fat, uh, wreathed by sprigs of cotton, representing the cottonseed oil. And other brands were similarly transparent. Cotto suet, an another cottonseed beef compound, similarly highlighted cotton. And Wesson's snowdrift prominently included cottonseed oil or cotton oil company in all of its advertising. From the 1890s through the 1920s, journalists wrote approvingly about cottonseed oil and a wide variety of cookbooks by some of the biggest names in progressive era food, like Harvey Wiley and Ellen Richards and Fanny Farmer, they all approvingly talked about cottonseed oil. And thus, Crisco's silence about it is all the more noteworthy. And it's striking too, because unlike more recent cases of industry evasion and cover-up, um, think for example, recent efforts by the tobacco industry to cover up research about secondhand smoke, what's noteworthy is that as far as Crisco knew, they weren't really covering up anything bad. They, uh, for example, we might think of Crisco and trans fats with hydrogenated oils, but they, did, they had no knowledge of that at the time. Instead, with their silence about Crisco's sole ingredient, its promoters accomplished two things. They responded to tenacious consumer doubts about cottonseed, and they forged a revolutionary new approach to food marketing that was geared towards industrial food. So let me just talk for a second about those doubts. Crisco's silence about its cottonseed content was a savvy response to genuine consumer prejudice about cottonseed, which had persisted into the 1910s, despite all of this other marketing and pro-cottonseed material that I've been talking about. This prejudice lingered for a few reasons. One was that many Americans still mainly thought of cottonseed oil as, a, as an inferior stand-in for olive oil, which they generally perceived as, this, as the superior culinary oil. And it wasn't just that people thought of cottonseed oil as better, but that they thought of cottonseed oil as an adulterant. Government tests, in fact, in this era turned up that indeed many marketers of olive oil were cutting their product with cheaper cottonseed oil or sometimes completely just producing dyed cottonseed oil and, and, saying that it was cotton, and saying that it was olive oil. And of course, adulteration was a major concern throughout this era. It was the driving focus of the 1906 pure food laws. And many of the substances that were being added duplicitously to food were undesirable. Some were even toxic, ranging from chalk to sawdust to lead. And especially before 1906, consumers had legitimate fears about eating food tainted with adulterants. But just because a substance was used as an adulterant did not mean that it was inherently harmful. And consumers, for the most part, realized this. Adulteration was an economic as well as a health concern. And at a time when food prices were rising, and when poor Americans on average spent half of their budgets on food, people were outraged to think that they might be swindled into paying upmarket prices for an inferior food. Cottonseed oil's well-publicized role as an adulterant fueled lingering prejudice against it into the 1910s. Another reason for consumer reluctance to eat cottonseed products was that Americans already associated them with a variety of non-food functions. Cottonseed oil was widely used in soap. This ivory soap was Procter & Gamble's other best-selling cottonseed oil product. It was widely used as a fertilizer. It was widely used as a, um, in a variety of industrial uses. Um, it was being used in everything from dye stuffs to making clothing, uh, to making roofing tar, to making um, hats. Throughout this era too, cottonseed Cottonseed meal's importance as an animal feed was expanding. And this association not only seemed unpleasant to some in its own right, the thought of eating animal feed, but also emerging research about cottonseed meal toxicity made some people reluctant to eat it. Cottonseed oil is not toxic, but cottonseed meal, remember I talked about the leftover mass of seeds, could be in large quantities. It, it contains a natural toxin called gossypole. 
and new research was strengthening consumer worries that it was dangerous to eat. Um, USDA scientists did some experiments where they, failed, where they fed this toxin directly to rabbits and everyone died. Um, USDA um, scientists too started feeding large quantities to horses and other livestock uh, because some farmers were doing that and they found that feeding large quantities resulted in digestive disorders and death and they recommended you know, no more than a pound a day for a thousand pound horse. You can still use some because it's cheap, you know, you want to use some, but don't use too much. And this kind of news kept fears about cottonseed toxicity live. In response to these various negative associations, worried consumers expressed concerns about cottonseed products through this era. Magazine advice columns regularly fielded questions like, was cottonseed oil a byproduct of soap factories? Or was it actually made from garbage? Hearing, you know, talk about it being a waste product? Was it dangerous to eat? Did it contain lead? And despite reassurance from advice givers throughout the era, popular doubts about cottonseed persisted. With their conspicuous silence about its sole ingredient, Crisco marketers did more than avoid evoking negative cottonseed associations. They also pioneered a revolutionary approach to food marketing geared to industrial food directing consumers away from food's ingredients and towards values like modernity, modernity, hygiene, and purity, and perhaps more than anything else, to the trustworthiness of their own brand. In the case of Crisco, there was a lot to talk about because hydrogenated vegetable shortening was a genuinely new product and it represented a, a true milestone in industrial food processing. Before Crisco, most factory food processing had differed from home production, mainly in terms of, of scale. Um, that is, food prepared in factories was made in vats, not in, not in bowls, and some unscrupulous producers might add adulterants, but for the most part, they were just scaling up processes that home cooks would have recognized. Hydrogenation, however, was something else again. First developed by chemists in the early 1900s, it allowed processors to fill most of the chemical bonds in oil with hydrogen, turning an unstable liquid fat into a saturated fat that was solid at room temperature, whose texture and density could be tinkered with by raising or lowering the amount of hydrogen forced into the oil. Hydrogen manipulated an ingredient on the molecular level, giving it altogether new properties. Since cottonseed oil had already been bleached and deodorized before hydrogenation, cottonseed shortening was a doubly processed product and it was utterly unreproducible at home. Early ads relentlessly touted Crisco's modernity, which they hailed as an unalloyed good. Crisco was a heretofore unknown food, an entirely new cooking fat. It represented progress in cooking. Marketers called hydrogenation a special process, an important scientific process, or mo most often, the Crisco process. Building on new consumer ideas about factory foods, and especially in the wake of the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, marketers claimed that Crisco was hygienic. Its factories were bright and clean, staffed by uniformed, cleanly workers who never touched the product itself. Even factory air was washed and purified. And this was true, they actually had sprayers, kind of just spraying the air in the Crisco factory. Marketers also stressed shortening's whiteness, a result of processing, linking whiteness to purity with slogans like white, pure, and wholesome. It was precisely because it had been refined and clarified, shortening ads claimed, that it was so pure and sweet. According to emerging marketing, highly processed foods were not just acceptable stand-ins for less processed foods, but they were better in all ways. Indeed, one of the most jarring claims of this era was that highly processed foods were natural. Crisco relied on cottonseed oil that had been deodorized and lightened, yet its ads proudly claimed the color, flavor, and odor are natural, and there was nothing artificial about it. It has a natural wholesomeness, other ads claimed, and it was sweet and pure because it is wholly vegetable. Today, of course, these claims seem oxymoronic. American consumers now think of factory processing and of naturalness as mutually exclusive properties. 
but that was not the case in the progressive era. Crisco's marketers boldly claimed that highly processed foods um, offered levels of cleanliness and impu impurity impossible in nature. In effect, factory processing made them more natural by removing impurities. Even Crisco's shelf stability, which today seems kind of creepy to us that you could have a tub of Crisco for years and it would still be good, um, was supposedly a result of purity. It stayed fresh because its impurities were, quote, eliminated by the Crisco process. The more processed cottonseed oil became, the purer it seemed to be. As Crisco's early marketing incessantly discussed the advantages of how it was made, while omitting all mention of what it was made from, the result was a new form of consumer ignorance. When we think of ignorance, we often think of it as natural, as organic, a, an absence or void where knowledge has not yet spread, as the historian Robert Proctor has put it. In fact, I, I went down a, a brief rabbit hole this summer trying to see if this historian Robert Proctor was related to the Proctor and Gamble people. He is related to some of the Proctors who were executed in the Salem witch trials, but not, not to Proctor and Gamble. This historian, Robert Proctor, coined the term agnotology to describe the study of ignorance. And one of his big points is that there is something to study. Ignorance is not simply a natural absence. In some cases, indeed, it is a deliberately engineered and strategic ploy. Crisco's marketing involved just such engineering. Marketers aggressively directed consumers' attention away from ingredients and towards a new conception of shortening as a platonic whole. In other words, as a product, as much as a food. Crisco is Crisco and nothing else, remember its ad claimed. With their laser focus on the virtues of factory processing, marketers helped to create a sense that industrial food products were wholly new entities, created far from farmyards and desirably distinct from agricultural commodities. Procter & Gamble's emphasis on products over ingredients would come to characterize the retailing of highly processed food throughout the 20th century. So to conclude, cottonseed shortening was among the very first highly processed foods, and in many ways the progressive era was the perfect time to bring it into the spotlight. Journalists at the time touted it as a modern miracle, a former waste product transformed through ingenuity into an affordable and uniquely clean, safe food whose purity was guaranteed not only by U.S. law, but by industrial processing itself and cottonseed was extraordinarily successful. The growing national market for cottonseed as an industrial product, a farm fertilizer, animal feed, and an edible oil for human consumption all helped cotton farmers. Meanwhile, the cottonseed industry supported not just rural agriculture, but also rural food processing. Historians have long talked about southern cotton mills, but there were hundreds of small cottonseed oil mills around the South in the first decades of the 20th century. And the presence of a mill could be enough to keep a whole town afloat. By the late 1930s, cottonseed's value as a Southern cash crop was second only to that of cotton itself. The success was not inevitable, but neither was widespread consumer ignorance about cottonseed oil's presence in the American food system. In 1905, the Atlanta Constitution had reported a conversation between a Western hog grower, so a lard, a lard man, and a Southern cotton oil man. The oil man was confident that consumers would come to appreciate cottonseed oil, which he called a purely vegetable product. But the hog grower dismissed such confidence as foolhardy. Consumers will never use it, he predicted darkly. There is too much prejudice against it. As it turned out, both men were right. Americans did come to appreciate cottonseed shortening as a product, but in the years after Crisco's launch, most did so with any cottonseed prejudices fully intact, precisely because they often had no idea what shortening was made from. Instead, Crisco's progressive era advertising described it as an ingredient in its own right, one that came from a sparkling white modern factory, not from a farm. We're now more than a century later, and very few Americans have any idea when they eat cottonseed oil products today, or even that they eat cotton at all. Cottonseed oil has been eliminated from some brands, including from Wesson and from Crisco, where it's been replaced with soy or palm or canola, or, or canola oils. 
but you can still find cottonseed oil all over. It is in mayonnaise and salad dressing. It's in crackers and cereals. It's in margarine and shortening. It's in Skippy peanut butter and Utz potato chips and some Girl Scout cookies. Restaurants use it in their deep fryers. It is one of the most widely consumed oils in the United States, and the chances that you haven't eaten it are very small. Yet despite its ubiquity, many Americans still have no idea how often they eat foods made from the cotton plant. Crisco paved the way for this kind of consumer ignorance. Its marketers made ignorance acceptable, not by hiding their product, but by putting a pail of 100% cottonseed oil right in front of people and telling them to think about other things. Bolstered by growing consumer confidence and government oversight of industrial food processing, especially after those pure food laws, marketers promoted the idea that processing was akin to purification, and they encouraged consumers to put trust in brands rather than to focus on ingredients. The progressive era is supposed to be a period when food processing became more transparent, and in some ways it was. But one result of growing consumer trust in government regulation and in specific brands was that Americans became increasingly comfortable with ignorance about the ingredients in their processed food. Today, as in the progressive era, food only has to be good to think if you think about it. With cottonseed oil, for more than a century, most people haven't. Thank you. I have a microphone here that doesn't amplify your voice, but does pick it up for the camera. So if you have a question, I'd like you to use the microphone if you don't mind. In the absence of immediate questions, I guess I have two. One, I was curious about the advertisement that you displayed uh, that included a recipe. So I wonder how much there was a sort of pedagogical device to the advertisements in a very specific sense. And then I am curious also about how this was internationally marketed, if at all under, I guess you're making the point that the brand name matters mm -hmm. and brand names matter less, I assume, for this era uh, when they're taken abroad. But um, you might be able to comment on that. Good question. I, I just know that, you know, basically there's, we're in the area in which I work, which is in Eastern Europe, um, there's a privilege placed on butter, right, mm -hmm. and, and dairy products. And uh, in fact, I'm so used to using margarine, I go in search of margarine <laughs> in stores and I find it very hard to mm -hmm. find. So mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. Those are great questions. Um, with the recipe in the advertisement, recipes often were pedagogical and they often included recipes as part of their text. They were also more text heavy in general. In fact, even finding kind of nice images to show for, the, for a talk like this is hard because so many of the advertisements are just a page of text with a title. Um, and yes, they were showing people how you could use it. Even if really what they were saying is this is interchangeable with things you already know, they did often include recipes, um, especially for cottonseed meal. Um, cottonseed meal did require different proportions than wheat flour, so they would often um, have specific recipes associated with that. Um, although that was uh, the one real recipe I showed was from a wartime cookbook, I believed, where cottonseed meal was being promoted as a substitute for wheat that would then be exported. I know much less about the role either of Crisco specifically or of shortening in general outside of the United States. Um, I, I suspect it would depend a lot on, you know, the cuisines of different places and their, their enthusiasm about, about processed food in general, but also, you know, are there you know, attachments to specific fats like butter and other places. So, I, but I just, I just don't know. And that's a, I'd love to know more. Sorry, um, Helen, this was wonderful. Uh, I have um, some curiosities that, uh, sort of speculations that I, I was hoping you might speculate along with me a little bit. Um, your uh, story is, has uh, stopped mostly in the progressive era, and I'm wondering what the further trajectory of this in the 20th century is. Um, and the reason why I wonder about that is because you presented your argument at the beginning as a sort of story about growing trust in industrial processing and growing comfort with ignorance, right? But, it, I mean, it's clearly not only that, right? Mm -hmm. Your argument is about a kind of lingering mm -hmm. bad consciousness about those things or a lingering discomfort or a lingering set of doubts about 
that modern promise, right? And they kind of, they're in the background for a while and then they come out after 1906. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering where it goes after that. So, you know, I could imagine a sort of story in which around the middle of the century, um, the doubts recede uh, and, you know, maybe in the 60s or 70s start coming back. And I, I can't risk sharing a little anecdote. Uh, I spent some of my childhood um, near In-N-Out Burgers. And uh, the question of what fat In-N-Out Burgers use to fry their uh, fries, which are exceptionally crispy, uh, <laughs> was uh, sort of always floated in this context. And the, the rumor was that it was cottonseed oil and it's not clear that it's food grade. You know, this isn't really a food product, it's an industrial product, right? It didn't stop me from eating the fries, but I mean, I, I think that there's a sort of moment for that. I imagine, I speculate that there's a sort of moment for that in the in the later 20th century. Well, so anyway, if you can say about something about where you imagine this goes, or if you know, if you've done some work on it. Yeah. So let me just start with your last comment, which is that it's not clear. It's not clear to me as a researcher that any cottonseed oil is really f all food in the minds of the U.S. government, because cotton as a crop is categorized as a non-food crop. There's not special cotton set aside for food use and then other cotton that's used as a fiber. It's all categorized as fiber. And then cotton seeds and then cotton seeds are used. But that affects what kind of pesticides can be used on cotton. And so as, as far as I know, non-food safe or non-food approved pesticides are still used on cotton products. That rumor is all around the internet, but I couldn't find and I was like, that can't be true. Let me let me let me find you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the USDA materials online, which is limited, um, trying to find the answer to this. I wrote to the USDA, which did not respond to my email. Um, so to me, this is kind of a question mark. Like, what is our, basically our levels of pesticide use or kinds of pesticides that are not otherwise approved for food products indeed used on cotton, which, as it's, as, which seems to be the case, but just seems like the only reason I doubt it is because it really, would you do that? Maybe. Um, with your other question, so I do see um, consumer comfort with ignorance having a kind of bell curve in the 20th century. Um, and it, by the late 60s and certainly by the 70s, you start to see some pretty um, significant consumer activism around fighting, pushing back against ignorance, pushing for more, um, I mean, every single thing you see on a food label is the result of, of a fight at some point, fighting for more labeling of ingredients, fighting for more nutritional information, but also fighting um, against certain at, um, additives, um, fighting for more research to go into additives and their possible connection to everything from cancer to you know, various different health problems that people suspected were involved. So by, and of course, by the late 20th century, we, we know there, there's a huge amount of skepticism about processed food and you know, the organic movement itself, which is not about processing per se, but often overlaps, was really growing. And you see this big natural foods movement growing up in direct opposition. So it is a sort of an arc. And, and I think many people are still, don't think much about where processed food comes from and don't care, but there's a significant group of people who do. Um, you clearly outlined how this ignorance is engineered and manufactured, and I just was wondering back when you started talking about Crisco and the hydrogenation, where you talked about liquid fats being seen as inferior, can you explain where that idea comes from? Yes. Well, I think it's less that they were seen as inferior, because uh, you're quoting me. I'm not correcting you, um, <laughs> but I'm thinking through this out loud. Because olive oil was seen by, by the Gilded Age progressive era as this desirable, somewhat exoticized food product. But few Americans cooked with liquid fats. And when, the, when they cooked with fats, it was mainly with tallow or suet, um, lard, and butter. And the, the, the first liquid fat they really encountered was cottonseed oil, which was cheap. And which, you know, again, people had these kind of negative associations with. So they, so they categorized this kind of liquid oil as a special kind of thing that the, they, they had doubts about. And if I can just ask another, um, follow, a, a different question. I found it interesting that Crisco is, not, is now supplement or made with canola oil. And I'm wondering if you've worked on canola oil. A couple of years ago, I was like, 
what is canola oil? Yeah. And Googled it and found out it's made from rapeseed, yeah. but because of the name, uh, you know, the, yes. it's, yes. it's maybe just another example yes. of Yes, I'm curious. Masking. I too was kind of like, I kept seeing references to rapeseed and I was like, what is rapeseed? Like, that doesn't sound good. And so I don't know it's sort of if canola was plucked out of the air as a euphemism or if it's like a Latin name. I don't know no, where. It's, it's actually like, it's, I think it's, it's two, two names put together, but it's just another oh, it example is. Okay. of masking Absolutely. what the actual yeah. product is. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know too much about canola beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Hi. Thank you. It was so much fun. <laughs> so great. Um, I have a question that comes from my own scholarship. So you're a working class guy, family, right after Crisco comes out, and the wife of the family which is normally who it would be, goes to a store and has these choices available to them. Crisco would have been what in terms of price? Um, cheaper, than, cheaper than large, cheaper than the animal product still. Okay. It, it well, was and quite, that was what I suspected because yeah. when I was growing up much later in the century, we shunned Crisco because it was cheap. Yeah. It was yeah. considered sort of the cheap working class yes. alternative, not just because of what the, shelf, the price is, but also because of the shelf life because it wouldn't go bad. Yeah, yeah, so it so seems scary. I'm just cu right, right. So curious, like, whether that figured yeah, into its from popularity, the beginning, obviously. From the beginning, it was cheaper than competing animal products like lard. And what's fascinating, I just can't resist sharing this, is by the 1920s, so, so one of the big ways that processed fats, like short, you know, industrial shortening or compounds, attacked lard was by talking about its taste. You know, this, our taste is neutral. You can use it in anything. It doesn't taste like lard. Lard has a lardy taste. You don't want that. It's, it's clear to me from 19th century culinary sources that people knew all about the taste of lard and appreciated it in many contexts. There, were, there was a much more porous boundary between meat and, and sort of savory meat dishes and desserts in the 19th century. Um, the, the one vestige we have of this is mincemeat pie. But there were lots of desserts that used not just animal fats in the crust, but actually meat in the, in the filling itself. And they were, they were unequivocally desserts. And so you see this consumer turn away from lard. They're told, you know, in what seems like a kind of top-down process, lard's taste is bad, it's, it's tacky, you don't want this, you want something clean and pure and modern. And by the 1920s, lard companies are deodorizing lard. They're actually doing the same process that cottonseed oil producers had done to, to carry away their, their flavor and their odor compounds, which I think is fascinating. Hi, Helen. That was wonderful. Um, I was wondering, because you talked about the turn of the century with cottonseed oil that was racialized mm -hmm. openly. Um, was Crisco ever racialized in the same way? So, yeah, I, I almost debated not showing those images because they're so racialized and really racist. Um, and I think, so the use of cotton in these turn of the century cotton seed advertisements made in some ways the use of these racialized images of black people picking cotton or in cotton fields, um, I don't wanna say inevitable, but it was, it was not surprising to me as someone who spent a lot of time in this era, just because these nostalgic images of slavery and the Old South were so omnipresent in food marketing, but in lots of other kinds of marketing too. You still see some of that by the 1910s and the 1920s, but I think Crisco's failure to use them is partly because they're not talking about cotton. So they're not, there's no reason for them to turn to a cotton field, um, but also because it's, it's becoming a little less fashionable for mainstream marketers in the first place. Hi, thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was going to ask you kind of a more philosophical question rather than a historical question. Um, there is a, a sort of underlying assumption that there's something kind of ontologically creepy about eat, eating cotton seed. Mm -hmm. um, even in your abstract, you actually go from eating, eating co cotton seed to eating cotton. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about whether or not the, the thing that makes it weird is because it's cottonseed or is it because of the hydrogenated process? Because it's like, it seems like there's, there's both. Mm -hmm. And especially since they themselves have focused on the process, how much, how much can we understand like what it is that we're talking about in terms of the product, in terms of what it is, and then where, you know, what we should be doing it 
doing with it, that is. That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, so I use, um, I talk about eating cotton sort of for its shock value because I think it is, I don't think most Americans are aware that they eat food that comes from a cotton plant, which is, of course, totally different from eating the, eating the cotton fiber. Um, but I, I do that as a sort of way to get people's attention. Um, I, I will just say that I personally don't find it creepy. Like I, I, maybe just because I've lived with this for a while, but I, I think I also, because I spend my life reading about food, tend to be less put off by things that other people find somewhat gross. Um, so I, don't, I personally don't find it, the, the cotton itself as a product, cotton seed to be necessarily off-putting, nor do I find hydrogenation in theory. Like I'm not ne necessarily someone who's opposed to all food processing as a matter of doctrine. Um, but I do, I probably like many people, am, am a little worried about trans fats um, because of recent re research. So I think there is some of both here. I mean, there's, and, you, and consumers focus on one or the other shifts over time. Um, and you know, what's interesting I think is that you see both of these kind of coming in and out of focus depending on what's, what's in the news or what's, what's currently um, of interest to people. Thank you. Time for one more question. I'm just curious if you know uh, what motivated the shift away from cottonseed oil in Crisco? Like, why did they decide yeah. to go a different direction? And did that have anything to do with the timing of having to label ingredients on packages, or yes. was it financial? That's such a good question. I don't actually know exactly. And even since I wrote, like, it's, it's becoming less and less. I think it might be partially that it's strange to people to see the word cotton on a food ingredient, even though we eat many things that we, we, I mean, there are petroleum products, like they just have other names on the ingredient list. So I don't exactly, I don't know the answer to this, but even since writing this, I've seen that Girl Scout cookies seem to be phasing it out. It's now on some, but not all. Um, so, but, but I don't really have a good answer for that question. Thank you very much.